Earlier this week, KUAC's Juanita Tucker spoke with Gordon Wright about his symphony and musical philosophy. So you add to them and add to, to what you hear. That, I, that would take a great knowledge of each instrument and how it how it's going to sound or how it combines with other instruments. Well, I think the, the instrument part of it comes a little later on. That's more the, the craft or the technique. But the inspiration comes from all kinds of places. Sometimes um, I would just sit down at the piano and improvise for an hour and not stop or anything, just kind of uh, trying out things, one thing would lead to the other, and then maybe en route from one thing to the other, I would, I would, I would come up with something that seemed uh, to have potential or was in character with the idea of the symphony. And so all these things add up. But it can be anywhere. I mean, even your car starting in the morning, there's a rhythm. There's so much rhythm all around us. Well, not with my car there isn't. It isn't so starting. Especially when two of the uh, cylinders are missing, you know, that there's... I just noticed uh, coming back from Kaktovic last week, we had the chamber orchestra on tour, and listening to the pitch of the two engines. Mm -hmm. And as the... Uh, two engines, as their pitch changed or increased, every once in a while they would be in unison. They would be exactly the same. Or maybe one engine would drop a little, or the other engine would pick up, and there would be these harmonic clashes between the vibrations, and they create overtones and all this sort of thing. So it's really just a matter of, of listening to what's around you. You know, I was going to ask you how long you'd been in Alaska, but I just, I think it'd be better worded to say, how long have you been an Alaskan? There's a difference there, I think. Well, I, I look at people who uh, were born here or who have lived out in the bush for 40 years who, or who came up over the Chilkoot Trail, if there are <laughs> any of those left, and I just say, well, we're all kind of carpetbaggers up here. <laughs> uh, but when I was... Uh, in the 11th grade in high school, in, of all places, Baltimore, Maryland, my art teacher couldn't figure out why I was painting all these log cabins with Arctic backgrounds to them and spruce trees and all this. And I couldn't figure it out either at the time. And now I'm beginning to see that, that I'd never really heard of Alaska or knew anything about it, that there was this uh, sort of instinct telling me that someday I would end up in this kind of environment. And, uh, and I did. Yeah, I've been in Baltimore. There aren't too many spruce trees around here. Not very many spruce trees. <laughs> How did you get into conducting? I uh, always wanted to be a conductor. When I was a little kid, I thought that was really something. So, uh, and my did parents... You, did you go to concerts and watch the watch I the did conductor? go to concerts. I did go to concerts. My parents... Uh, are not musicians. All my mother sang in church choir, and um, there was a good, healthy respect and appreciation for, for good music in our home, and a lot of opera and so on, and a lot of records in the old 78 RPM records. So I wore them out, just listening to them over and over and over again, and I was really fascinated by the, the idea of a symphony orchestra. and. Uh, Conducting one just seemed to me to be, uh, there wasn't anything else I'd rather do, you know, want to be airline pilots or bus drivers or go to the moon or something. I just thought conducting a symphony orchestra would be kind of the ideal thing to do. You didn't, you didn't get into it a, on a bypath then. It was, that's something, that's just what you always wanted. There have been a lot of detours in my life to, to uh, actually, uh, it's very difficult to find an orchestra. You know, there are, there are maybe a um, thousand orchestras in the country, maybe 1,500, and there mm -hmm. are 10,000 conductors. <laughs> it's a very, very competitive field. Supply and demand. And fortunately, um, Fairbanks was just ripe for my particular abilities, which I mm -hmm. think are um, very strong in organization and motivating people and getting them mm -hmm. to, to uh, do their best. Why is that? Why is that so important to get people in the community involved? One of the articles that I, I read about you, and uh, you said something about, I feel it's important that everyone in the community 
uh, be oriented toward music, get involved in their symphony and so on. Why is that so important to you? There are, people have many, many other interests. Why is music such a great one? Well, I guess there's a certain missionary <laughs> zeal in this and that uh, I've, I have just, uh, I just feel that listening to music and music itself is uh, such an important part of the good part of our life. In other words, music makes people feel better and think more clearly and, and just it's like uh, of all the dimensions let's say after feeding yourself and housing yourself and you know earning your daily bread the amenities of life then begin to follow and to me one of the prime amenities is music and I think it's true almost there's so few people who have nothing to do with music who, who don't listen to music of one sort or the other and I just feel that the uh, so-called great composers and have very great ideas to share with us and I'm just promoting sharing those ideas with everybody now uh, who, do you, who do you get involved in the symphony uh, are they all professional musicians or how would you how would you describe the people who get involved with the with the symphony orchestra you mean Fairbanks mm -hmm. uh, aside from the music teachers in the community and the faculty members, uh, everyone there is not a professional. I would say they're not professionals. That is, they don't... Uh, both orchestras, the symphony and the art chamber orchestra, are volunteer orchestras. There are two paid people, myself, and it's part of my university teaching load. Mm -hmm. And then our manager, Therese Kaptur, who is uh, working under a um, CETA grant. And, uh, a program for training orchestral management mm -hmm. and it's something that I've been interested in for a long time tried several times to get this going not only to help me do the job which is an important part of it but also to uh, develop an organization that uh, if I'm run over by a moose or for some reason can't continue to do this that there's an organization uh, supporting the orchestra that, that can go on, you know, a real Something functioning organization. And an organization like this is really a community organization. I mean, the university's role in it is very strong in that it provides the facilities and my um, part of it and a lot of support. But the uh, overall impact of the orchestra on the community is dependent upon the association, the symphony guild, the volunteers, mm -hmm. all these people working together so to get our message out. So it's kind of a, a linkage between the university family and, and the Fairbanks community? Yes. Well, I guess they call it town gown. <laughs> and <clears throat> from my experience, it's been one of the most successful town gown activities I've ever seen anywhere. And I think uh, it's this relationship between the community and the university is talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. But I think that the symphony is one of the most successful ventures along that line. Is it possible, Gordon, for a, for a serious musician uh, to make a living as a serious musician in Fairbanks? Uh, you said that everyone connected with the symphony, except a couple of you, is voluntary. Uh, could a musician make a living in Fairbanks or in the interior with music only? A classical musician, I don't think, could do it right now. Um, our philosophy for the orchestra is primarily recreational and educational. Now that's not to say that down the pike we'll not have a professional orchestra here sometime. I mean, but you need a much larger population base mm -hmm. to do this. Would you like to see that? No. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why? Why or why not? I, I don't think, uh, what, one of the things I like about Alaska is the diversity of communities. Anchorage wants to be a big town. You know, I think we need a big town. Mm -hmm. We need uh, medium-sized towns like Fairbanks. We need small, smaller towns like Juneau and Ketchikan. We need villages like Kaktovik and Venatai. And this diversity, which allows people to develop a lifestyle consistent with their own beliefs, I think is very important. In other words, we keep the choice. Um, 
and it's I think it's just a uh, just a truism that to have a professional orchestra anywhere you need an immense population base mm -hmm. and especially in, in Alaska where well, for example in Seattle you have old wealthy established families okay. with holdings or in Chicago and San Francisco who have traditionally since the early 1900s put a lot of support or even back as far as Carnegie and Rockefeller and all these people mm -hmm. uh, built up these organizations. Now in Alaska we're starting uh, rather late and doing it in a more what's the word, democratic basis and a lot of support is coming from the state itself. And I might point out that Alaska along with having the highest uh, federal aid per capita in the country for whatever reasons I don't know. Also Alaska, the state of Alaska contributes more per capita to the arts mm -hmm. than any other state in the Union. Uh, New York is second. Yeah, I wonder if it first. has something to do with the involvement you're talking about, individuals getting involved and I think a lot of it, things on. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with an intense commitment on the part of the artistic community in Alaska, and I say that meaning that Alaska is a small town. Yeah. And there are a lot of extremely dedicated and gifted people here. From my own point of view, my interest in the Fairbanks Symphony is keeping, well, you hear the word homegrown. There's a lot of homegrown talent here. We can't import people to say if I'm missing a bassoon or a clarinet, you just don't call up and ask for have a clarinet sent in. You can do that in Seattle. There's mm -hmm. this big talent pool. So we are required to develop the talent that's here. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity to do that. I mean, here with uh, people get a chance, you know, and students who come to the University of Alaska, music students, for example, if they go to Wisconsin or Illinois or somewhere, they're not going to play in the symphony. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to happen because if you have 500 music majors and maybe uh, 70 of them are going to get in the orchestra, whereas here we take kids right out of high school who have had, you know, just your average technical development and we put them right to work and they have an opportunity to play Beethoven and Brahms and all this sort of thing. <clears throat> and you have the people in the community who have had more experience. In some cases, uh, some of my players have played professionally, but not in Alaska. They're here mm -hmm. for other purposes. I'm interested in your, in your teaching work too, uh, that you mentioned the students. That I suppose there's no magic in numbers, but how many students do you have, at music students? How many music students? Well, we have currently about uh, 60 majors. And then we have a lot of people who are taking music courses. Now, I do believe that right now the music department is either the largest or the second largest department in the college mm -hmm. and one of the largest in the university. And I think this has come about because of uh, just a lot of hardworking, ambitious people who are yeah. trying to make it work. I wonder if that kind of community involvement, something you, you said a moment ago there, made me wonder, uh, has, has being here in Alaska, do you feel it's developed your skills and your talents? Uh, especially uh, anything in particular about the Alaskan situation or being in Fairbanks mm -hmm. that's, that's helped you in, you know, in your own individual uh, talents? Well, I think so. For example, I don't, I don't think if I, if I were still living in Wisconsin that I would have I written this symphony or have developed a chamber orchestra that travels around mm -hmm. to the bush. I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to ask you about how you feel about pioneering uh, with the chamber orchestra, going around to the villages, and I understand in many places this is the first time there has been a concert of this kind in, in the village or in the area. How do you feel about pioneering that kind of thing? Is that a pretty good feeling? Most of the time it is. I, I have um, had some misgivings about um, bringing this kind of culture and, and civilization into a community that has by choice chosen to remain isolated and say um, un, 
unreachable by roads. And I think a lot of communities in this state prefer to keep their isolation. Mm -hmm. And this is the message we get when we travel. Of course, we, we charter in by plane. I wondered about your reception. You know, what, what do people say? What do they tell you? I would say, and I just added up the statistics, we've just finished playing our 83rd concert in Alaska, and I think our 50th community. And I don't know if, any, if you can name 50 communities in Alaska, <laughs> but we've been to 50 of them. And I've never heard a discouraging word from any of them. The, a lot of it has to do with the resource people in the community. Some communities have people who really think this is great, and others think, well, um, it can't hurt anything. <laughs> yeah. So what a lot of it depends, <laughs> it depends on the community yeah. itself. They're not all the same. Um, another part of it is that they understand why we're there. And we're not, uh, that we're not preaching to anybody. All we're doing is showing the communities what it is we do. This mm -hmm. is Western music. And I'm talking about the native villages now. But this is Western music. These are the instruments we play. And in many of the villages, we have uh, made deals. We give a concert, and then we take a break, and then they sing and play for us. We do exchange concerts. That's great. And last week in Kaktovik, they had four drummers and a whole bunch of dancers. And we sat around, and we had just had a real party afterwards. <laughs> so it gets into a one-on-one -on -one situation, and it's not just one way from what you're saying. You're, you're getting something from them, and they're they're getting something from you. I've learned a lot too about how to present this music to the communities, and and to uh, make it as human a, a thing as possible. Well, do you feel in those terms that the that the Arctic Chamber Orchestra is a is a success, if you can if you can define that? Well, I don't think there's any anything to compare it with. There there are no other organizations in Alaska who have our record of travel. Mm -hmm. Certainly no orchestra has traveled as much as we have. In fact, no other organization. I feel that um, we have one disadvantage in that we're performing a, a service. I think that is a desirable service and I really have to scrounge and beat the bushes to get financial support. And that's not even, and no one gets paid, that's just to pay the plane bill. And the communities can't afford to pay what it really costs to bring an orchestra in. But this past year, we got legislative support. There's a major, the Big Dipper or the Great Bear. True to its Alaskan heritage, the symphony was composed by kerosene light with warmth from a wood stove and a cabin tucked into the Chugach Mountains outside of Anchorage, overlooking Turnigan Arm. It is not easy to translate musical meanings into words. Mr. Wright says that the symphony is fairly traditional. The music is scored for a very, very large orchestra with an unusually large percussion section. Like the state which inspired it, the music covers large spaces. The music is not intended to be profound. It is intended to make audiences feel good. Since recent events have led the nation as a whole to see Alaskans as being primarily concerned with land disputes, Mr. Wright hopes to demonstrate through this work that we have other interests and concerns as well. There are melodies, chorales, contrapuntal sections, inventive and programmatic portions to the work. There are contrasts. The work was originally planned as a kind of pastoral symphony. The opening fanfare conveys the dimensions of Denali, large blocks of sound. But these could also represent a sunrise or sea ice or another gigantic event or process. This section is subtitled Fanfare for the Great Land. The next section is more abstract. Professor Wright has always admired the old master's use of counterpoint. In this portion, the composer enjoys these structural puzzles and weaves voices horizontally. There follows a bittersweet duet for oboe and trumpet written for Jim Kowalski and Candace Shannon. The academic section returns followed by a trio for horn and two clarinets written for Ted and Kay DeCorso and Chip Davis. A transition brings us to the Northern Lights, which is what one might hear if the Aurora made music. Returning to the podium now is Professor Gordon Wright. Symphony in Ursa Major.